welcome, John. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so grateful. Thank you for having me in your studio, in your home, even though we're across the, the, the country from each other. Across the country. That's one of the upsides of technology, which we'll talk about a little bit <laughs> today. But That's right. first, I just, I want to say your book encompasses so many of the things that I think really capture kind of what's wrong with society today, but you also provide solutions, you know, things that we can each do to make things better. And I'm, I'm never going to get to all the questions I want to ask about your book, but I thought maybe we could start with just if you could generally let the audience know what the book is about. Sure. So the book is really, uh, the, my story is threaded through it, but I won uh, back in 2010, 2011. I had a I had the job, I actually had a couple of them, and I had the fancy pants degrees, and my wife was a fancy pants researcher, and we had a little kid. We just won, and my body said, I'm out. And so I had this, this I'd followed this path that had been, that had been laid out for me, which is you're going to get these degrees, and you're going to chase these metrics, and when you get to these particular finish lines, then the confetti falls from the sky, and you're done. And what it cost me on that journey of just doing what I was told was everything. And so it, 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 the next 10 years has been me trying to figure out what happened to me, what happened to my family, what happened to my community, my friends and their marriages, what happened to our country, and ultimately landed on two things. We have two paths forward these days. One path is you are your feelings. Whatever you feel is just follow that into the wilderness and into the woo-woo, and you are only going to be as much as the worst thing that's ever happened to you. You'll only be a survivor of the worst experiences of your life. You'll only be the thing. You can build a thousand bridges, but if you cheated that one time, you're always going to be a cheater. You're always going to be the worst thing that ever happened to you. So you need someone to come save you. You need some exterior entity, some government agent, somebody to come in and rescue you because you are broken. You're the worst that ever was. You and your feelings. The other narrative we've, we've been given, the other path is forget your feelings. Um, in fact, if you have feelings, it's a character issue. You're weak. You're a coward. Grind it, kill it, crush it, drag it, all those, you know, the whatever words, and go get it done. Make a lot of money, get more toys, get a bigger house, keep going, going, going. And I'm calling nonsense on both paths. And the, my book is really a letter to me. It's a letter to my kids. It's a new third way, which is you have to acknowledge and be honest about what's happened to you, the things you've done, where you are, what your reality is. And you wake up and say, I was abused. You wake up and say, people did treat me differently because of the color of my skin. People did do x they did do y i did x and y and the magic question is so what do i do now and the book is the back half of the book is what do you do next and i'm all about optimism and healing and moving this thing forward yeah i loved it and i as i mentioned before we just started i could relate to so many of the things including when i hit that point in corporate america and thought i'm not happy like all the toys all none of that is helping <laughs> and but what really resonated was my friends thought I was insane. And you mentioned mm -hmm. something in the book about your friend's reaction to you deciding that this is not the way to go. And I think, I do think it takes a little bit of courage to stand up and say, these paths that everyone else are setting for us are not making me happy. I mean, I think that that's really important, but I do think it takes some courage. Mm -hmm. um, now, I find that most of my clients have no idea that they're telling themselves stories or what the impact of those stories are. And you also include in the book sort of what I would call our collective stories. You know, it's mm -hmm. the stories that, that we're sort of told as a society or as a, a group, and we end up believing them. And so that was, that's one of my next questions is, can you talk about the stories that we've been believing around technology and innovation? Yeah, so I, it, it can be called the zeitgeist. It, it's these stories we're born into. And they happen at the macro level and at the micro level. Like you and I may have been born into different homes that said, here's what we think about God in our home. And here's what's true. And here's how we do holidays. And we're not that kind of family. We're not a Lexus family. We're a Corolla family. We would never spend money on that kind of stuff. And those stories, just they're, they're the air you breathe. That's just who you are. Or we don't wear clothes like that. We wear clothes from goodwill because that's we're not spending money on that and then you you might have been in a, in a vice versa house right where how, who would ever wear that 
right? And who would ever dry that? So there's the micro, that's just our internal homes. That's what our churches, our coaches, right? Macro becomes these meta stories, which is right now that everything is falling apart and that we're all going to be dead in the next 20 or 30 years, right? But to answer your direct question, technology and innovation is going to save us. The way we've lived for thousands of years, the way people have grown and lived in community and worked and died and reproduced, all of that is going to be a thing of the past. We're going to solve for death. We're going to solve for 11G, I'm sure, in the next few years. We're going to have why, why have regular reality when we can have augmented reality, right? Why buy a real home when you can buy fake uh, digital property in the metaverse, right? It's this technology and innovation is going to save us. One of the ways um, I think that we're all dealing with it is it's going gonna, it's gonna to improve communication. It's going to improve, improve connectivity. And so now I've got a thousand friends. I got a thousand friends on the internet. And if I get a flat tire at my house, I look down. There's nobody that can come help me move my couch. There's nobody that can help me change a flat tire. And so I've traded intimacy and I've traded relationship and I've traded the messiness of knowing my neighbors for this pseudo innovative technological solution to that, that sort of discomfort by having a thousand friends all over the place, right? And so this illusion that we're going to have to tech our way out of some of this, um, again, it's just one of these stories we've been bo born into. And I'll say this, I love air conditioning. I love that we're talking across the country in real time like this. I love that thousands and thousands of people will listen to this interview and we will never see their face, which 50 years ago, 100 years ago would never be the case. I love that. And it's not going to save us. It's not going to be the solution to end all, end all. It's not going to make me whole. It's not going to fix my marriage. It's not going to fix my friendships. Absolutely. And I, and it's changing so rapidly. Mm -hmm. I just don't know how many people are even consciously aware of kind of the path that's leading us to, you know, which is, I agree with you. There are wonderful benefits to technology and innovation. Um, but there's also this factor of increased loneliness, increased depression, and, you know, all kinds of problems that are coming out of it that it feels to me aren't being addressed very well <laughs> so i was well, really and, and then, then we try to solve for oh they're more anxious well let's make an app for that and let's um let's come up with a digital solution for a neural feedback machine like why don't you just turn the the box off and go for a walk with a dog you know what i mean it's like we are trying to solve these problems that are creating more problems that we're not trying to solve more problems and we're just on a treadmill um you're right it, it all all this comes back to that one of my favorite lines from any movie ever, the very first Jurassic Park, when the scientist, uh, not the scientist, but the, the he, he was kind of the, the rogue scientist, looks at the, at the dinosaurs and said, we got so excited about if we could, we never stopped to ask ourselves if we should. And that's where we are. We keep coming up with cooler and cooler, cooler things, and it's taken our souls from us. Yeah, yeah. Jeff Goldblum, I think. Right? There it is. Jeff Chaos Goldblum. scientist. Yeah, yeah. There you go. No, I, I totally agree. We, and I don't think we stop to think if we should do some of the things we're doing. We just keep doing. It. Um, what about the impact of the stories that we're told when we're young? What, what do you think the impact of some of those are? Can you describe that? Yeah, I think that's, I think for many of us, most of us, that's the root of trauma. That is, here's what you are worth. Here's what you're not worth. And those stories can be explicit when your mom says, you're disgusting, you smell bad, get away from me. Oh, my goodness. Boys aren't going to think you're cute if you wear that shirt. Go change your shirt. Um, or suck it up, son. Get up. We don't cry in this house. Those stories just become part of us. And Or my favorite is, that didn't hurt. And I'm four. And I look at my dad and I think, okay, he's smart and big. So I think he must be right, but I did hurt. So now I'm going to internalize at the age of four that I can't trust my own body. I need to outsource that to other people. And there's never going to be a shortage of somebody telling me what your value is. And so these, and that's not my real father, by the way, I'm speaking broadly. My dad's a pretty great guy, but, but, but we are so held captive by the stories we were told. And those stories can be the things that we weren't told that nobody said, Hey, you have value. Nobody got down on your and looked you in the eye and said, I love you. Nobody said, we're so glad you are part of this family in this season because we, we can't function without you. Um, 
those things that we should have been told or that coach that said, Deloney, you're always going to be terrible at fill in the blank. Or I had this thought the other day. I had a high school coach that told me his name is Zoe Simpson. Deloney, you can do anything. And at my current job, I had an 18 month ramp up plan. I got hired in, in February of 2020 and they helped me to, they hired me to help with mental health. And I didn't know anything about radio. I just been a, a nerd at a college for all these years. And they, uh, all of a sudden COVID kicked off and they said, well, we're going to figure this out live in front of millions of people. And my head went back to Deloney, you can do anything, right? It's those stories, those stories, those stories that we carry with us every day. Yeah. And, and again, in my experience, a lot of people don't realize that that's maybe the root of what's going on and they don't realize they're repeating the stories and then they're even passing the same stories down. And so I think it's so important for people to recognize what's going on between our ears. Like so much is just in our minds and we do have some control over that. You, uh, well, when you're, well, let me, when you, when you are the young kid and it's your job to make sure the adults in the house don't get over emotional, when it's your responsibility, hey, don't say that it's going to make dad mad. Or, hey, I'm guys, let's don't tell mom that because she's having her glass of wine. And this is when she gets angry. If we talk. let's don't let's just let's just keep this here. We broke the window. Let's just not say anything till tomorrow. When it's your job to make sure that the adults in the house don't get overreactive, then you fast forward 25 years later and you find yourself doing things at 12 o'clock at night that your boss said you will do. And my job is to make sure he doesn't get mad either. My job is to make sure my kids are all at peace, that my, that my new romantic partner is not lashing out because it's my job to make sure the other, you know, see what I'm saying? Like yeah. these things haunt us and we, you're right. We pass them along to our kids. We then pass them to their kids. And that's how this stuff just burns through family histories. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. And kind of along those same lines and a lot of the work we do here, both on the podcast, but also in the workshops that we do is related to the awareness and also the power of thoughts. Yes. And you talk a lot in the book about how we can change those thoughts that are not serving us. And so I was wondering if you could share a little bit with our listeners how to go about that. Yeah, so I spent a chunk of my career um, working in the ugliest, messiness, messiest moments of people's lives, um, hugging a mother whose child has passed away in the next room or showing up with, on scene with police officers and SWAT officers. I've, I've done that for behind closed doors for years. Um, and just my dean of students role at various universities, sitting with folks whose kids had just taken their life or sitting with somebody at a psych psychiatric unit. What we often do in those moments is our bodies, not often, are in all of those moments, our bodies take over for us. And there's some great built-in defenses, whether it's fight or flight or disassociation. There's all these great tools that our bodies have. And you wake up two months later or three months later, or you're just struggling with the news and the news and the news and the news, and suddenly you just feel the, the paint coming off your car. You know I mean, it's just peeling off of you while you're driving down the road. And we find ourselves ruminating over and over about a conversation we're having in our heads with somebody at work that we're never going to have in real life, but we're just having it over and over. We start thinking about, well, what about this? And then what if I don't have enough meat, so I'm going to get a bunch of meat, but then what if the light power goes out? So I should probably get solar panels. I don't have that money, so I'm going to go ahead and take out a loan for this. But then if I, oh, then what if the credit market collapses and now we're trading coffee and gold and bullet, right? You can... Your brain's job is not to solve those problems. Your brain's job is to make sure you're safe. And it will always find a scenario that you've got to stumble through. And it was the great David Kessler, who's the, the, the grief guru, who at one of his clinics was talking with a group of parents who had lost their kid. The worst thing that can happen to somebody is you lose your child. And what often happens when someone loses their child is they are stuck in the moment of pain. They are stuck in that moment that their child decided to take their life or in the car wreck and or in the casket and those thoughts lightning bolt into our minds. So what David Kessler had his audience do is this. It's beautiful and brilliant. He said, I want everyone to close your eyes and I want you to imagine a purple elephant. And so they all go through the exercise and they all do. And then he catches them real quick and says, everybody open your eyes. You just proved to yourself that you can control your thoughts. And they all went, oh, no. Right. So we have to understand that rumination and worry feels like positive, helpful thinking. It's an utter, absolute waste of our time, full stop. 
it solves nothing. And in fact, it spins our bodies up and it's slowly killing us. We have to understand that the fake conversations solve nothing. We're rehearsing tragedies that will never happen. Um, we have to understand that the, the worst last pictures in our minds, our brain has a vested interest in those pictures because it wants to protect us from that ever happening to us. It's not helpful for healing. And so what I've learned to do and I've practiced year and it's part of just a mindfulness training that's been part of my life for the last decade is being highly intentional about my thoughts, what goes into my head, how often I watch the news, which by the way is basically never, ever, ever. Um, who I talk to, who I interact with, what I watch, what I listen to. It's a highly curated sensory um, library, if you will. I'm just real protective of what goes in my mind. And I can't stop the lightning bolts. I've seen things, I've experienced things, I've seen things that people shouldn't see. And those lightning bolts pop into my head. And at that moment, that's when I've got a choice. Am I going to meditate on this? Am I going to think about this? Am I going to let my body run off into the woods with this? Or am I going to say, Nope. And I'm going to have another thought that is one of beauty, one of peace, one of action, what comes next, that's going to replace that thought. Here's a simple one. So that sounds all woo woo. And like you and I are like staring over a cauldron, like brewing things while we're talking together. Here's what that looks like in reality. I'm exhausted. I come home from a long day at, at work. I've been doing tons of media and writing all this stuff. And I walk into the house and my wife's shoes are right by the door and I trip over them. And my first thought in my head is, what have you done today, right? Like what, what have you, not, not to mention, I've got two maniacal children. We've got a crazy house. She's got her own, she's a writer. She's got her own stuff. She's 10 X busier than I'll ever be. My first thought is, what are you doing? Like, what, what is this? That's the moment that I can decide to go down the rabbit trail and be like, you know what? She doesn't even appreciate me. Does she have any idea? I can do that or I can stop. And sometimes my wife will roll her eyes. I'll just yell in, as I'm walking through the living room. Nope, I, I'm, I, I will stop myself from these thoughts. But I can say, nope, I can bend down and pick those shoes up. And I can choose to think, man, she's had a busy day. I'm going to take dinner and I'm going to get the dishes too tonight. I get to choose each one of those. When that guy cuts me off on the highway, I can choose. Is that guy trying to kill me? Or is that guy trying to get to the hospital to see his wife before she passes? I get to choose that story. And it's part of reclaiming my thoughts over and over. If I miss a workout, am I really the worst dad? Am I really a lame loser? I get to meditate on that. Or thank goodness I got to get another two hours of sleep this morning. I'm going to get it this afternoon. Or I'm going to take a break. My body's tired. I'm going to get it tomorrow. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to consciously practice. That's why I love meditating. It's just practicing controlling thoughts. Just like a basketball player shoots, it's that same level of practice. But it's all about owning and taking captive our thoughts back. Yeah, it's so funny. It's automatic for me now because, and, and I think we should probably point out, everyone has those thoughts. I mean, they do come up. It's not, you can't, you can't prevent a thought from popping into your head necessarily. The lightning bolts happen. That's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> but for me, it's, I question, why am I thinking mm -hmm. that? Like, that's the first thing I do is do it automatically. And sometimes I do it out loud and people look at me. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> why am I thinking that? You know, I can choose a better thought. I can choose something that's going to make me feel better. So my new is, question, my question to myself is, what is my body trying to protect me from? Yeah. And can I tell you, both of us, um, I think the key to changing your thoughts um, is curiosity. Mm. Most of us go to judgment. If you're curious, what is that thought? Or yeah. what is my body trying to protect me from? I can usually tr trail it back and my body doesn't spin up all the cortisol and adrenaline and get me ready to fight something. I can just inquire like a math problem. I don't like math problems, but right, it's, it's a math problem. It's a yeah. literature problem. It's not a an existential crisis. Yeah. Yeah. And I think too, you know, kind of where I got that, why am I thinking that is in early work, it was, you know, trying to understand that I am not my thoughts. They pop into my head, but that doesn't mean I have to do anything about it or, but now I'm even like, well, what are you thinking? Think something else. And it's just, <laughs> it's lovely that it's automatic now. Cause I rarely ruminate about anything. It's, right. I'll start and it's like, what am I thinking? Um, but anybody can do that. And like you said, it just takes practice, like consistent practice. You know, at first it feels a little exhausting, you know, to constantly kind of monitor what you're thinking, but after a while it's, it's not hard. It's just becomes a habit, which is a whole nother topic. Right. Um, another thing that you talk about, actually, I think it's the final step on the path, but it's around changing our actions. Mm -hmm. And you talk about how much we're on autopilot. And so what I'm wondering is, if you can share a little bit of wisdom on how we can change habituated actions to move toward that 
better, you know, well-being, relational health, mental health? I love that question. So I, I do think culturally we're on the tail end of, I think, therefore I am, that you can be tragically abused as a child. And if you can just have the right thoughts that it'll all be okay, um, that you can experience systemic racism year after year after year. And if we'll just, we'll just do some cognitive behavioral therapy, we'll change the way you think about some things and you'll be better. And I, I just looking at the literature, at the current literature and the way people lived um, for thousands of, I think that's wildly inaccurate. There is a season when I don't feel like doing stuff. My thoughts are, I'm, they're, they're, they're mud. I'm, I'm slogging through it. And there's mornings I have to get up and move my body. I have to go do. What I have found, um, and this came from, again, the great James Clear. Um, I, he had proposed something that I had never thought of before. And that is, we're goal-obsessed society. We're obsessed with our goals, our goals, our goals, our goals. Man, you can, you can cross the finish line like I did. I crossed the finish line financially. I crossed the finish line academically. I got my big fancy pants PhD. And by the way, there's nothing more annoying than someone who just gets their grad degree. They're the worst. I was that guy. Um, my wife and I were fancy pants. We had a kid after years of infertility. Like, I crossed the finish lines. Um, I checked the goals off the list, but there was no reason to have been there in the first place. And so what he recommends and I have found across people I talk to all over the country is let's not be so obsessed with goals out of the gate. Let's, let's change our identity. And so instead of I'm going to run a marathon and then you get into the second week of training at 4 a.m. and it's cold and it's dark and you're like, what am I doing? Start with, I'm a guy who honors his body. I'm a good steward of my body. I'm a guy who's going to roll around with his grandkids when he's 90, and that work starts today when I'm 40. I am a person who's a steward of, the, of my body. Running then takes care of itself. Or in week two, when my knees don't work and my ankles hurt, I think, I think I'm going to lift weights for the next season. And I don't lose a lot of sleep. I don't get washed in shame. And so I'm, I'm, when I'm going to change habits, I'm going to start with, who do I want to be? Who do I want to be? Why do I want to be that person? And I've found this is to be important. I'm often a terrible judge, which is why I think we have to have community. We have to have people with us. They'll help define our calling. So when I, I was a dean of students at a university here in Nashville, when I got the opportunity to join this team and take this gig, and um, I actually flew to Texas, where I'm from. I was born and raised in Texas, and I met with some guys that I've known for 25 years. And I said, here's the opportunity. Here's what it'd be financially. Here's what it's going to be here. But I've worked my whole career to get to this one job. And they looked at me and said, you're crazy. And then they said, but this is right. This is exactly where you need to be. And they gave me a piece. My community helped define my calling in this season. Um, and so I'm going to look at my identity. And then I'm going to backfill that identity with what are the action steps I need to take to become a guy who's a steward of, of his body, to become a, a man who takes care and loves and is present with his kids. Who's a guy who's really present with my spouse, right? I'm going to have those identities and then I'm just going to backfill the actions. And I've found that to be infinitely easier. And then the ugly part is a lot of days I don't feel like it. I just don't. I don't want to be nice to my wife. And so I've got these weird built-in rules for myself, which is when I feel like being ugly, then you got to do the dishes and the trash too. Um, on the days that my friends call and say, hey, we're getting the fights on Saturday night. You come in to watch. And I, my first thought is, dude, I'm going to bed. Oh, I have to go now. If I have that thought, I have to go. The mornings I wake up and I'm like, I'm not lifting today. Oh, you got to do two today, right? So I have some built-in triggers for myself that um, inspire me to get in there and get that stuff done. That's great. Um, the, so there are, are five actually steps on the path uh, that you describe in the book. And it's actually right, I think it's in the first chapter, but I wanted to save it toward last because I think it's really important to understand that first of all, this is a, it's a path, it's a journey. It's not, it, it, it's again, that goal thing, the destination. It's not so much about getting to a destination. It's about living with life the way it is, which is not always perfect, usually not. It never um, is, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. especially in the times we're living in now, it, it, there are a lot of challenges between the pandemic and COVID and now the war in Ukraine. And yeah. there are all these things that people can just make themselves really sick over right. um, in addition to possibly being sick. But I mean, mentally, we just, we really, I think it's so important that we start to understand that we need to take responsibility for our mental health because if you don't have your mental health, 
doesn't matter how many times a week you work out, right? You've got to have the stuff up here yeah, that's right. kind of clear where, you know, you, you do know your identity or, you know, what it is that you want that is fulfilling or, or purposeful in your life. But I was wondering if you could just recap or kind of give us a little bit of information about the five steps that lead to this. Um, you bet. And I want to preface the steps with this. Um, nothing drives me crazier than those rare nights when I'm up at 2 a.m. and there's somebody on TV just scrolling through that's, um, well, I don't have TV anymore. So this is, I've got a TV, but I don't have cable anymore. But years ago, when you scroll through and there's somebody like with the nine steps for new abs or the 14 steps. <laughs> This is not that at all. There is no, there is no steps. You're never going to run outside and be like, I'm not depressed. This is not how our bodies work, right? right? There are five principles that whatever you encounter, you go back to over and over and over again. And this is a lifelong practice. It's breathing. It's brushing your teeth. It's just the way it's going. It's washing your underwear. This is the rest of your life. And it's not a guarantee that things are going to go right but it's a guarantee that when things come, and they will, you've got both feet on the ground. You have a foundation underneath you. You've got people around you. So ultimately, you have to own your stories. And for most of us, that takes years to pull the threads on all those things. Some of them are big at first. Some of them acknowledging trauma, acknowledging abuse, acknowledging where you messed up or you hurt somebody. Sometimes the big rocks are, are easy. you got to own those stories. And ultimately, you have to then acknowledge reality. Here's where my life is right now. I wanted to lose this weight. I didn't never mean to be 100 pounds overweight. I'm looking in the mirror now. This is where I am. I never meant to hurt people. I didn't think, I didn't know those jokes hurt people like they did. I didn't mean to say those. I mean, I meant to say them, but I didn't mean to hurt. Or I never occurred to me that underpaying my employees, it never occurred. All You got to own your stories and then you got to acknowledge reality. Here's where I am. Here's the state of my marriage. Here's the state of my mental well-being and my mental health. Here's the state of my career. Here's my relationship with my kids, my coworkers, my neighbors. I got to own reality. And then this is probably the most important. If you told me to pick one to double down on, um, there is no such thing as any sort of long-term behavior change, life change, family tree changing that somebody can do on their own. I'm a lifelong Texan. We, we helped perpetuate and invent this myth of the Lone Ranger. It's not real. You can't do this by yourself. And so before you run out into the wilderness to find yourself and to create your new life, you got to get other people around you. So the, the third stone in this path is you got to get connected to other people. They are your emergency fund for life. Um, they're the ones who show up at 2 a.m. when your kids got to go to the hospital, but your other kid's asleep and you're a single mom. They're the person who comes over to your house with half a bottle of wine and a gross casserole when your mom calls and says she's got cancer, right? They're the ones that violate the mask rules there in Los Angeles and show up anyway to your birthday. I'm coming because I love you. That's, you got to have those people. And then you have a lifetime adventure of step four is learning to control your thoughts and step five, changing your actions. And it's both and. Yeah. And, and. It's not easy. I mean, I want to be really clear about that. I, I know it was hard for me to go through it myself, but it's interesting to me that we avoid looking at our reality as if by not looking, it changes it somehow, um, but yeah. we do it because we think then we're keeping ourselves safe somehow. And in fact, everything else we do to try to avoid it, whether it's drinking, smoking, overeating, like all the things we do to try to numb the the feeling so we don't have to look at it, those things are actually the things that can kill us. And so, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it's, it's painful, but it's not, it's not, it, it's in our minds. <laughs> like if we just right. understand we're not in danger, it's just uncomfortable. For well, a while. and here's, here's the beauty. Um, I had somebody call into my show the other day and she, her, they were, she was, they were a newlywed couple, only been married a year or two. And he was diagnosed with bladder cancer. Mm. And she calls, he's, he had surgery, he's in remission. And now they're on the three, every three months you have to go get blood work done for the next couple of years. And she called and said, how do I not be so anxious about all this? And I said, I'm going to tell, tell you something that nobody's told you. And I'm going to, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to love you enough to tell you the truth. And she said, okay. And I said, your husband might die. And she wept. But when she came back, her voice was so, 
we'd finally spoken it out loud because my next statement was, but he probably is not going to. And uh, her body had been solving for he might die with cortisol and adri- all the stress response hormones slowly eating her inside, literally physiologically eating her insides, just melting her from the inside out, making it impossible to connect and, and to come together with her spouse during this hard trying time, right? So we have to say the, the hard stuff out loud and then demand evidence from that. He could, but he's probably not going to. The doctors cleared him. And I, found, I was like, what made you a, an oncologist? Because the doctors have cleared him. She's like, yeah, but, but, and now we're back to, now you're not controlling your thoughts. And your body doesn't want you to forget because it doesn't want you to get cancer. It want him to get it. Right. We got to take control of our thoughts. Ah, so true. Speak it out loud. Speak it out loud. And then let's get on with living. Absolutely. Well, there are so many other fascinating things in the book, and I'm sorry we're running out of time, but I do so appreciate you. I want to say too, I appreciate you sharing your personal story in the book. And again, there were so many things I resonated with. Um, but I, I was laughing at first about the cracks. I have to say where you were seeing cracks <laughs> everywhere because you know I think we all, we, we don't realize we're becoming obsessed with something that's trying to tell us something more important. We just follow the, the surface you know, signs. And so I will say the book starts out that way and you have my <laughs> attention at the, very, at the very beginning. Well, thank um, you. And there's a lot more information about trauma and all kinds of things that I, I just really think would be very beneficial to people. So thank you very much for sharing your information here with us today, but also for writing the book. You are a saint, and I'm so grateful for your hospitality. Thank you for putting peace into a loud, messy world. Thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm.